燃え上がれガンダム<音楽>はい。We get to meet our boy Shar as novel in Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin proper because he does some pretty cool fucking shit and some fucked up shit in this episode. Sean, this has been one of the most excited,、uh, one of the episodes I've been most excited to record for three plus years now because,、uh-huh. or almost three years, we're coming up on three years, sorry. Because, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm, I'm all jumbled up here because, you know, as I've said before, Gundam The Origin, one of the first Gundam things I watched after watching First Gundam with you on the show.、Um, and I don't know if episode three is my absolute favorite. I will have to rewatch four, five, and six and make、mm-hmm. that decision. But I do know that I think Dawn of Rebellion is one of, if not just the most entertaining hours in the history of Gundam. Like, it is. I could watch this thing multiple times in a row. It is such an entertaining 60 minutes、mm-hmm. of television.、Um, and it is easily one of my favorite individual Gundam episodes because if you like Char being an evil sociopath in Mobile Suit Gundam, this is one of the best concentrated doses of delicious evil Char mixed with a bunch of other good stuff. It's got Char and Garma. Oh man, I am, I've been excited to talk about this for literal years now. And I have pages of notes. I love this episode so much. Yeah, it's, it's really great because it definitely i t s that thing I think you talked about in the first episode of us covering the origin that some of the origin feels like it's like the HBO version of Gundam where you get these big, like, luxurious hour long episodes. And this is in particular that, that, like, it's.、Yeah. It is both, it gets like the luxurious production values, but the other thing about HBO shows is that they are just like in- intensely entertaining and they just have, you know, good violence and like good big character beats and stuff like that.、Um, and, and that is very much what this is. And you just get to play with Char,、um, is kind of what this feels like. It's just this, this episode gets to have so much fun with that character. One of the things I found very fascinating is that,、um, as with last week's episode, I've caught up with and read. Um, the manga version of this.、Uh, and this is of the episodes we've covered so far, like by far the most different、yep. um, any of the episodes are. There are lots of changes, there are omissions, there are additions,、um, in such a way that I kind of like almost kind of think of the, this section of the manga and this episode as slightly different things because they're telling slightly different stories. And that's really interesting because episode one and two are super close adaptations of the manga, so much so that, like, Either one could basically be a replacement for the other.、Um, like, you could watch the OVA of episode one and then pick up where the, that ends, where the manga begins, and just move on, and you would not really notice a difference.、Um, whereas with this episode, like, they're kind of different things, and that's pretty interesting as like, an adaptational choice. There's at least one big change that I've, I've thought of since I read the manga, and I have a giant like, paragraph of text summarizing in my notes, because I didn't know that you were going to be this far in the manga、uh-huh. for us. But there's one that actually like, significantly changes your reading of the entire series, honestly.、Um, but yeah,、I'm, and there's probably a bunch of smaller ones that I don't remember off the top of my head because I have not,、uh, I read the manga about half a year ago.、Um, but yeah, it is,、uh, it's, but it's also a good feat of adaptation. This is another one that like、mm-hmm. laser focused on what the arc is and starts with Char doing the murder that makes him Char. 
and ends with him embracing his love for the color red. And along the way, this is also the episode where Shuichi Ikeda, he's been a little yes. muzzled. You know, in that first episode, he doesn't get much because it's mostly Mayumi Tanaka doing the part. In episode two, he's mostly playing Edward Mass. He's playing someone who is not quite Shara's novel yet. And in this episode, Sean, they, they open the cage door and they say, Fly, Shuichi Ikeda, fly! And he yep. fucking soars. He is so good in this one, Sean. Oh my god. I mean, it's definitely, it's my main memory of watching this originally was just coming away from it feeling like, I have, I have always wanted this. I have just wanted an hour of Char doing Char shit, right? Like, if you just ignore all the rest of, like, the cool stuff that's going on and the only thing you take away from it is it was incredibly entertaining watching this, like, scheming, mischievous, sociopathic, terrifying <laughs> motherfucker just, like, manipulate everything around him to the point of basically starting the one-year war um, and and setting off on the, like getting people killed through manipulating events and setting off on his path to eventually um, manipulate the person who he's posing as like basically his best friend um, in the future slash the past depending on your perspective on um, like the flashback and all that kind of stuff it is just the most char ass shit all the way through and yes this is where Shiji Kata just gets to like just go full bore into the character um in in a way that we have not been able to see since like unicorn gundam with full frontal you know of just this shuchikata just loving every single line he gets off that script in the way that only he can yes oh my god it is this is this is why we watch gundam man this is good fucking stuff so yeah. where do you want to begin with episode three dawn of rebellion Let's, let's begin with the beginning because this is uh, where, you know, one of the kind of the changes they've made is from the manga um, adjusting where some like kind of the stories begin and end. So this episode has almost like a cold open. It's got the same, you know, like the, the narration of Akiotsuka and everything we talked about before. And then after that, you get the scene at the airport with um, actual Shara's novel and uh, Castle Rim Daikun posed as Edward Mass. Um, and the whole circumstances of Cassilia Zabi plotting uh, Edward Mass's death, uh, and then Edward switching identities with Shar as Novel, getting the actual Shar as Novel killed, um, and then Castle Rim Darkoon adopting Shar's identity and going on his happy way to Zoom City. Um, and all that happens at the end of like the previous volume or whatever the manga and here it's effectively a cold open that then goes into the title dawn of rebellion for this episode and it's stylized in some very different ways than that sequence is done in the manga that i think is very interesting yeah i think because i was reading through it last night just that scene and that scene has some great stylistic choices like it ends on the body of the real Shara's novel floating through space, the eyes like in the back of the head um, mm -hmm. with like debris around him. And then the words Edward Mass, Texas colony over him as that is what he will be remembered is the dead body of Edward Mass. Um, but I have long, long, long loved this opening as one of my favorite things in Gundam. There is a, there's a real argument. What is the most evil thing Shara's novel did in his life? This is a candidate, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's like certainly like maybe the most cruel, just like the most needlessly cruel because there's not even like a war going on because for some of that other shit, at least there's a war and that kind of, you know, it's it's such an extreme scenario. It excuses, can excuse some things. What what like our Char does to real Char here of just taking this, you know, maybe slightly misguided but pretty normal young man, Shara's novel, who's just going to go join the military because he thinks it's cool, which is a thing that I disagree with, but it's a thing that lots of people do, and, you know, it is it's it is just a part of the world. And he takes that kid, and he just, knowing every single step of the way what is happening, manipulates him, thinking that, like, with the actual Shara's novel, thinking, oh my god, this is such a good guy. I can't believe how much he's looking out for me. Like, how just, like, he's just really, <laughs> he thinks and cares so much about me and my future. All the while, um, our Shara's novel is just wafting real Shara's novel slowly into his grave, um, none the wiser. It is the most just pettily cruel thing he has ever done to a human being for nothing other than his own convenience and benefit. Yes, and it is, I mean, he plays this entire Kaecilia Zabi spy network like a fucking fiddle. He yes. knows 
that if he leaves Loom, that Kaecilia Zabi will try to get him killed. Because he's good at under... Kaecilia Zabi is a smart person, but she's a fairly simple one. He understands yeah. this, right? They will try to kill me. Okay, if they're going to try to kill me, I have this kid who is my doppelganger. I will slip a gun into his bag, and I love it's probably a gun he stole from the Osnabal estate, because it's like this 19th century replica, right? Like yeah, a, yeah, it's like a Colt Army revolver from the 19th century, so like yeah. a Civil War era pistol. Uh, it's yeah. like a very nice recreation, uh, because it's a very, like, if you've seen a Wild West movie, you have seen that gun, because it's like yes. a very standard Wild West pistol, and, 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 and yes, he, he yeah. sneaks it into his uh, luggage. Sleeks into his luggage, gets, you know, the real shard to change clothes with him. It's the whole thing is a microcosm of what he does to Garma Zabi over the course of Garma's uh-huh. life, of making him think everything he's doing is for this person, when really it is against this person. Um they they put some they toss some wrenches in there with Garma in this episode that I think is really cool. But with this you definitely have he is just using Shar, and Shar thinks that Casval or Edward is the nicest person he's ever met, you know? Um, and instead, he is just, again, as you say, wafting, just leading him to the slaughter. It's And, and the slaughter of, like, countless other people on that ship. Like, because yes. he also knows they're going to blow up the whole fight. Well, I don't know if he knows they're going to blow up the ship, but it's a possibility. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Yeah, he doesn't yeah, give a shit. He doesn't give a shit. Um, one of my favorite... The moment where you just know that Ikeda is in full Char mode in this episode is, you know... Um, the real Char is like being really apologetic, like like you know when he's leaving, and the guy, the agent at the gate says, "Man, he sounds like you'll never see each other again." And uh, Edward Char goes, "So this nay," and it's like <laughs> it's the most perfect Shuichi Keda. So this nay, and I just I love it. God damn it, I love you. Um, he is cut and loose, and it's great. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. And and one thing they do here for the anime version is they take a scene in the manga of Cecilia Zabi hearing the news and ordering all this to happen, which is its own like sort of distinct scene that happens beforehand. And they turn it into this very like Shakespearean like soliloquy towards camera basically that is a really cool thing of like it's Cecilia Zabi against a totally black background talking into the camera, ordering this death then the events happen and then um they she comes back into this like black void to talk to the camera um with these lines that she has um from that scene that they kind of have reordered of her saying like you know i gave you a way to escape castle rim daikun like if you had just stayed um quiet on loom none of this would have happened um but but like now i you know i've ushered you to your death uh, and then that like melts away and the logo for the episode comes up and it's that is the thing of where as an adaptational choice I think it's like such a cool way to sort of fuse these two scenes together and use it as this very like dramatic powerful intro to this episode rather than it being the tail end of um, the previous story arc. Well, at 100%, and the way they do it is it's even better than what you're saying because the ship explodes with Edward, yes. with, with, with the real Char on it as Edward, and out of the explosion comes Kaecilia's face. She has mm-hmm. the line, and then it fades out just to her eyes over the black screen, which I it's the kind of thing that Yasuhiko does do in the manga sometimes, not in this scene specifically, that is an invention of the anime, but it feels like a very Yasuhiko touch. And then the title comes out of that. It is cool as shit. Yeah. It's just, it gets you pumped. Uh, It's very fun. Uh, It's also, this is the, the way specifically that actual Shara's novel dies is so fucking great of where he's re- like looking for his papers because of course um you know uh castle rim daikun has stolen them because he's taking uh shard's identity he's like no where's these papers like if i don't have these papers like i won't be able to get in and ruin my life and then he explodes <laughs> yep <laughs> and it's uh and the bomb is like it's it's very much it's like uh sasura zabi in episode one you know uh Kisili has a very clear uh mo for her crazy murders which is just <laughs> put a bomb directly under the seat of the one person she wants to kill to like make sure that you are going to blow the fuck up because both Sastro and uh Char have the bombs explode from under their seat and they go and then the whole thing goes with them. It's uh you know she does not take risks when she is going yeah. to kill someone she is going to make sure there is nothing of them left and it is yeah. very good and god just 
I think this is such an ingenious backstory because the idea that the Sharaz novel we know got that name by making this putz kid trust him and then sending him off to die in his place is the like best retconned backstory of all time in terms of like it makes 100% sense. I fucking love it. Yeah, it is a pretty airtight thing of like he's just completely adopted this other person's identity and like none the wiser and he just moves on with his life because they are like you know the zombies just firmly firmly believe the castle rim daikin is dead like as far as sayla knows her brother is dead even if she has some new typey like intuition going on um it's it is it is a very clean getaway that he has very clean getaway uh there is one other thing they cut in the manga here is that um and, and this was not needed i think for the end i think this was the right call but there's a scene of sayla after Shar has, after Caswell has abandoned her, who gets um, Roger Osnoble, the father, to like fly her into the docking bay to try to see if right, they yeah. can find him in time, and then the, the the ship explodes. So, and I think that is, I think for the way they adapted this, that's cleaner. Of the last time you see Sela is when he leaves. I think that's smarter and, and adaptationally for the anime, it's it's better the way they do it. Yeah, I mean they've they've made the very clear choice of of focusing. Um, these episodes because the manga is like very big and it's got like a lot of different characters that are involved because like over the course of like the section that this adapts from the manga there are lots of other scenes with like the earth federation and stuff and tim ray that they just don't bother with because there's a clear intent on we are boiling it down to who is our focused um like daikun sibling for this episode it was artesia in the previous one this one it's char um, slash castle and then also you have your like side plot of ramba Rao and the zombies in like the development of the mobile suits and those are like the two main things that they key in on and focus on and most of the other stuff is either like adjusted or cut um to like make this kind of clean focus on who is our who is our daikun kid and then what is going on with the mobile suit stuff yeah and it is it works so well for this one. I think one of the reasons why this episode just plays like gangbusters is it borrows the... It doesn't borrow, but it has the spine and structure of a military academy story. You uh -huh. know, it is... Um, it's not quite stripes with mobile suits because it's not that silly, but it is kind of like the right stuff with mobile suits at certain points. Um, mm -hmm. There's a million like different military academy stories that do the exact plot of we have a big hiking mission and there's two rivals and one of them gets hurt and then the other rival decides to take pity and helps them up. Like For All Mankind, which is one of my favorite recent American shows, does that in its like third episode, I think. There's just so many like military fiction stories that do that. And so it has this like sort of like archetypal structure to it um but it's an archetypal structure where your main character isn't some plucky young upstart it's sh fucking soci sociopath shara's novel trying to engineer a war <laughs> yes um yeah that's the thing that they focus on it's much more distinct in the anime version than it is in the manga because they've kind of narrowed it down to that specific story and, and they've expanded on like a lot of the elements of like the military academy life in different ways and, and focus more in on that um and i think yeah it works very well for this like hour-long like tv episode slash movie kind of thing that it is yeah and the other spine that it has that just makes this episode so delicious i don't know how else to say it is it has garma and char and it has that yes. as the key relationship of the episode and if, you know, there is anything I didn't quite get enough of in Gundam 79, it is more of Char subtly needling and just hopelessly gaslighting poor little Garmazabi, and he does a lot of it here. Yeah, and the weird, like, vague homoerotic attention yes. between those two characters also is, like, it's, it's, if you, if you ship Sharma, like, this is the episode for you, right? It's like, you get, you get Char coming out of a shower you get like him wearing a towel and Garma's in the room. Like it's just, it's all the things you want from these two characters, which is homoerotic tension and like sociopathic manipulation. Um, and it, and you get a lot of it in this episode. It's great. Well, let's, I, I want to talk about that right now, actually, since you brought it up. Um, I think that's something that the manga Yasuhiko, and you've read enough of it that you, you would know this. I think Yasuhiko really plays up something that we have not actually talked about on this show. And I think we should. Shar is queer. Like, 
I don't know how mm. else to say it. I, I don't know if he is... I wouldn't quite say he's gay. We see him in relationships with women at different points. Char is definitely, like, on this on this, on the Kinsey scale somewhere. Like, there's just something about that, and I think it comes out in a lot in moments with Garma, but it's in other places, too. And, like, the, the anime, the OVA doesn't even do as much of it as is in the, the manga in various points of him. He's, like, just, you know, body wet out of a shower hanging out with Garma and things like that. But also down to, like him in like the entire regalia that Char is always in there's like this is something even my students picked up on a little bit when we watched the movie trilogy is someone asked about this and like you know what kind of elements of queer coding are at play with that character and I think it's something that I don't know if that was conscious in 1979 but I feel like Yasuhiko has picked up a little bit on when he comes back to it for the manga yeah it is it's like it's an interesting thing because it's like because it's hard to know and like put yourself in the high, like the mindset because it's you know it's such a different like kind of cultural perspective of like 1979 japanese um creators of like what it's like does that code clearly like is it like and meant to be campy in that sense right and like the proper sense of camp of of having kind of homosexual homoerotic coding but it certainly I mean, it feels like it. I mean, in the like in the fan community, it is received that way, right? In the same way that like Kira and Othran's relationship in Gundam Seed is received that way, um, because there is like a long, long history in anime, um, in manga of coding queer relationships between characters that are never like like fulfilled in that way on screen, right? But are clearly there and that fans take and run with in like the doujin fan market and create their own stories and basically fan fiction around it um and you see that like that exists in certain extents in like certain kinds of western fandom it's way more ubiquitous in like otaku circles um and in like char and garma or like sharma as anyone should call them um <laughs> is like is like is definitely one of those pairings but i think one of the things that's interesting to think about with char is like is he like is he bisexual or is he like asexual but like is but is canny enough to use his sexuality as a like a tool to manipulate people like does he actually feel sexual desire for people or does he like know how to touch that part of people and use it as a way to manipulate them i think that's a real question and i think i generally probably fall towards the latter on him you know, I think I think the queer coding is there from the beginning, whether they were conscious of it or not, because yes. there's a long history in animation and and everything of your villain who is a little exaggerated and campy. I mean, Disney is great at this in like the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s. And I think the culture has kind of gone on a, a weird 180 on this, where I think there was a time in like queer studies where you would say like, you know, your character's like... Ursula and Scar and Radigan and stuff are negative gay stereotypes because only the villains get to be gay. And then I think now it's like, they're the most fun characters in the fucking movie. They have yeah. personalities. They're great. You know, like, would it be nice if they had more positive representation? Sure. But, you know, Ursula is like one of the most obvious, like, examples of drag in mainstream culture, you know, at a certain point. Um, based on the the, the, the the actor Divine. So, like, there's stuff like that. Um, or the drag queen Divine. Uh, and, and Char obviously plays into a lot of that history, I think, with, like, the way he dresses and, like, his very particular method of talking is, is like, Frieza comes out of a similar, um, is, is cut from the same cloth in Dragon Ball Z. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's always there. And then you do kind of interrogate the character themselves. And I think this is on Tomino's mind to a degree. I think it's something you're supposed to be asking in Char's counterattack is, like, he's in this long-term relationship with this woman in that and he is sort of letting um oh what's her name what's the little the, the younger woman's name in that uh um, quest yeah he's letting quest have this crush on him um but i don't read in that movie that he has real sexual desire for either of those women um yeah and his most important relationship in that movie is his relationship with amro like that's yes. the that's where he actually has like a real connection with somebody he yeah. doesn't really have much of a connection with like Nana who is like the woman that he is clearly like he is sleeping with her like there's no you know it, like the only way to make it more explicit is you literally explicitly saw them have sex but it's like so strongly implied that you must assume that that, that he is sleeping with with Nana Miguel um but his relationship with her from his side feels so cold and like manipulative and he's like feels like he is holding sex and like her desire for him over her as a way to like keep her working for him which he does um, with Quest. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, like, I think 
and I think it's all somewhat complicated because I, I, I probably go maybe slightly in between the two options you gave us, Sean, which is that like, I think he does have actual desire for Lala when we see that. Um, and I don't know if it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird kind of desire, but it's something very real there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think there is a there is a certain charge in nature to some of his relationships with men that the word that I kind of keep coming back to is queer because it's a little more all encompassing. Yes. Um, and it doesn't have to be as defined. But um, it's like we could devote a whole other podcast to this. There's a lot to break down there. Yeah, because part of his the thing in Star's Counterattack with Quest is also that like he completely misunderstands and misapprehends like the nature of that relationship. Yes. He interprets the relationship as Quest having sexual desire for him and that being the thing where like Amro much more like astutely observes that the things that she wants is like a father that supports her and that's why she's like chasing after these older men. At first it's Amro, then it's Char because we see at the beginning of that movie how like awful her relationship with her dad is. Um and that like and that's like part of the thing that feels like a bit ace about or asexual about Char is like he intellectually understands sexual desire. Right. But like, but because he more intellectually understands it and he doesn't fully emotionally understand it, he misunderstands a lot of his relationships with people. He misunderstands his relationship with, um, oh God, I'm blanking on her name, but the woman in, in Zeta Gundam that leaves and goes and joins Rekua. Circo. Yeah, yeah. Rekua. Regalunda, um, he like misunderstands that dynamic and that relationship. So it's like he is both simultaneously very savvy about some of the ways that like sex plays into his life, but then also seems so completely like ignorant or like stupid about how it interacts with other people at the same time that that's part of like where I see the kind of like asexual nature of the character. I think that's true. And I think because, and we talked about this a lot in last week's episode. We never are in Char's head, really. Yeah. We get glimpses, but we don't get in there. I think I think you can kind of go either way. I think there. I think the the Ace reading is like very clearly there in a lot of ways, and I think the sort of queer, almost pansexual reading is also there mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And you can't really say one is right or wrong because we don't know, you know. Yeah, because either way, like, whether or not he, he feels, like, legitimate, like, sexual desire for, like, Amro or Garma, he, he, he will never act on it, right? Like, he right. will, like, if he feels it, he represses it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it is, it is, like, a very clear, deliberate choice um, in, in origin here of, of calling back on those, like, homoerotic elements that are from both the original story and then also reproduced in the origin manga of like the shower scene and all that stuff that is like, you know, very clearly there is like a homoerotic dynamic going on there and reproducing that. But in a like very classical, like boys love or BL, um, which is, you know, the, the term for um, the type of fiction that is about like gay romance that's mostly targeted towards heterosexual women in Japan. But it's like a big subculture genre in Japan and the like all boy academy whether it's like an actual a school school or it's a military school like with a historical setting that's very typical and this is like a pseudo world war ii style setting that they have with this land of like nazi germany-esque dynamic between like the federation and um the zeon and all that kind of stuff um it is like definitely leaning into and feels very conscious of the ways that like those things are coded in society as like homosexual relationships of developing young men in all boys schools. Yeah, I mean it's inherent to the genre because it's homosocial relationships at a minimum. Yeah. And so homoeroticism is almost always going to come into it whether you intend it or not, you know? Um the some of the ones I gave earlier, you know, from like the silly like stripes to the, you know, classic like pillars of the genre like the right stuff or something, it's it's there either way. I mean, there's a scene in in this, and it's it's also in the manga. It's like it's an important enough scene that they adapted it. Um, that where Garma falls asleep at his desk, yes. like muttering about the scene where he covered for Shar after he gets slapped in with the sunglasses and all of that. And Shar goes over, he looks at him coldly, and then puts the blanket over his shoulders. Like, that's there, that's there is no way to read that scene as anything other than there is like a homoerotic dynamic at play here to some extent it's like but it's like the extent of like what are Char's intentions there and what is he actually feeling that is a thing that i think is like impossible to give a definitive answer for because well, it's like 
what is he doing and feeling in that scene feels so distant and weird and kind of alien. That has long been one of my favorite scenes in the entire origin OVA. I love it in the manga. You talked last week, Sean, uh, and I talked about it in, in week one, about how Yasuhiko's manga is very decompressed, which is to say that yeah. it takes a lot of panels to do simple things for the reason of really studying characters' emotions. And that is one of those moments where the scene of him going and putting the, the blanket on, there's just panel after panel after panel of looking at Char's face and his eyes. Sometimes they're covered by the sunglasses. Sometimes you can see one eyeball. And you are trying to read, why does he get out of bed, go over to Garma, and put this blanket on him? And I love that scene because it is, it's one of the most like abject versions of Char. It's the middle of the night. Nobody else is around. No one else is watching. There is no material gain to really be had from this thing, but he does it. And so you're wondering, is it, is it a real affection? Is it, is it a, an actual like sexual or just brotherly affection that comes out from that? Is it because he's paying Garma back for sticking up for him earlier with the, uh, the military guy? Cause that's one of the only moments that Garma affirmatively asserts leadership without Shar's prompting. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or is it something more sinister? Is it like, I got to keep this boy under my wing because I have plans for this kid? There's a lot of ways to read it, and there's no right answer. And that is why we will continue recording exorbitantly long podcasts <laughs> on the subject of Sharas Nobel and his psychology, right? Yeah, because it's, it's, because, because like kind of all of those things are at play at the same time, right? That, that there is, it, it, his relationship with Garma, I think one of the things that's fascinating about it in this kind of prequel version gets to zoom in on it is that Garma is the person in some ways that like Char should have been, right? He yeah. is the young boy who is the heir to the great, like, you know, controlling force of the space colony. Like he is, you know, effectively like Garma Zabi is the de facto inheritant of the philosophy of, of Zeon Zoom Daikun as expressed by the Republic of Zeon, which is ruled by the Zabi family that Garma is like the favored son of, you know, obviously like Giran is the one who is actually in control, but Degwin has the greatest affection for Garma and is clearly like the one, Garma is the one that Degwin cares about. Um, and so Char like kind of sees that. I think it's impossible not to like see himself in that. That's part of, I think, where the like, very conscious choice of the funeral in episode one for Zeon Zoom Daikun. You have the moment where um, young Castle Room Daikun looks over and sees Garma. Um, and there's like a moment of like connection visually with those two characters um, is that there is a like mirroring of the prince who has been just deposed and the like, not commoner, but like the aristocrat that has been elevated into nobility in, in the deposed prince's place. Yes. Um, it's, there's, you know, so there's like, there's like jealousy wrapped up with anger, wrapped up with this revenge mission, wrapped up with, I think, the eternal question from Gundam 79 on through the origin. In what ways does Char like Garma? Like, does Char uh -huh. just observe him as like a fucking cockroach to be stepped on? Does he actually like this person in a friendly way, like enjoys being in their company? Does he like him on another level in that he would like him to come join him in the shower, maybe? Like, you know, like all of those... Uh -huh. And I kind of vacillate on that. I think there's at least some degree of actual affection for this kid. I do not think he ever hates Garma in the way he hates Kaecilia or something. But Because Garma has no part in any of the rest of right. that shit, right? I mean, it's the thing that he tells Garma when he, you know, does like, you know, the very sinister thing of calling in after <laughs> he's assured Garma's death. And he tells him, like, regret the fact that you were born into the Zavi family. Like, that's the that's the reason he gives to Garma for his death. It's not any specific that Garma's done. It's just the fact that you were born into that family, and that's why you have to die. So it's like, regret that, you spoiled brat. Ha 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 ha. Well, that's what I was going to say. Off. It's regret that, and then it's listen to me laugh while you die. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. He still stick whether or not he, you know, whatever the reasons, he still sticks the knife in and twists it. You know? Yes. He twists the knife in a way he doesn't have to just for his revenge. So there are a lot of questions there. And, you know, I got to say, it speaks to how good, unusually good the origin is as a prequel. That, like, this could so easily be like fanboy wish fulfillment. More time uh -huh. with Shar and Garma, yay. And instead, I think they do it 
per- perfectly, like literally perfectly, mm-hmm. the stuff between them in terms of actually enriching that relationship, our understanding of it, the psychology of the characters feeds perfectly into original, you know, first Gundam 79. Um, it works perfectly, and I can I can very easily imagine the more, like, creatively bankrupt version of this where it's just a prequel for the sake of spending more time with them. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely... And I think it's part of the, you know, the origins of this thing as in manga, right? Like, pun yes. not intended there. Um, but the the fact that this is designed from Yoshikazu Yasika's perspective as like a sequence that is like enriching a story that he has already told in the manga version. Um, it like, I think that's part of what gives it that dimension. If this was only and solely a, an original anime project designed as a prequel to Gundam and not a retelling of Gundam that incorporates a prequel into its narrative, um, I think you would get the like, ah, this is just the fan, like whatever. We just like, you just have, it might be kind of fun, but it doesn't enrich anything about your understanding. And instead this is like very consciously meant to be commentary on and feeding on and building on those characterizations as Yasukazu Yasuhiko has like reimagined them in his manga version. Yeah, the bad version of this would be the prequel checklist of like, what are all the things you want to see more of from a Gundam prequel with all these characters who eventually, you know, might be dead, but now they're alive. And the thing is, Gundam The Origin does wind up hitting most of the things you would probably want on that checklist, but it does it because it's telling a very fulsome, expanded story of the original first Gundam, and then it breaks into this flashback, where, as you say, Sean, everything it's doing has some relationship to the story as Yasuhiko is telling it. Uh, and so there's a there's a real integrity and thoughtfulness to it that you wouldn't get from the let's make a prequel for the sake of a prequel version of this. Yeah, and that's and that's where you get this core dynamic of this episode of of, of Char and Garma's relationship and the richness of it because that richness is there in the original dynamic in the relationship. You just get to like have a deeper window into it, um, and it's yeah, like it's it is phenomenal. Absolutely. So. Let's 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 back up a little bit to the entire Shar Garma dynamic because it really does have this like, you know, sort of classic military movie feel of it starts out and Shar's the kid who's good at everything, damn it, you know. He can run track the fastest. He's great at basketball. I love that basketball scene. Uh-huh. Um it's very good animation there. He's the one who figures out the math equation and Garma is just he's, darn it, Garma can never be as good as Shar. And then they have this hike they're hiking on the trail and Shar winds up saving him after pulling out the knife and then whittling fucking spears to really, you know, that is also one of those scenes, Sean, that is just stuck in my fucking brain in the fucking hippocampus of my Gundam fandom is Char with the knife over Garma making the spears. And then they turn out to be things for the tent. God, he's, he's very good at this. The anime version in particular, like really lingers on that moment more than the manga does. Like they, they take their time with it. Um, and there's something about this whole dynamic of the episode that they definitely they exaggerate it um from the way the manga does i think very intentionally like to like sort of narrow its focus of that there's a more there's like a a bigger extreme gap between like char's performance and garma's um where like garma like the way his relationship with the kind of lackeys that follow around him and his cronies is way more exaggerated and more gag manga-esque like it's it's very like severe um, whereas, like, it's a bit more core sort of grounded the way that that's depicted in the manga. There's less focus on it. But it's stuff of, like, you have a really great moment where after the equation thing has happened, uh, Garma stops Char outside the, the building. And then one of Garma's cronies puts his hand on Char's shoulder and Char just glares at him. The guy freaks out. And that's as far as it goes in the manga. In the anime, they then add the guy, like, slides backwards 50 feet like breaks the curb the concrete curb with his feet and like falls back into a bush or something because of like the incredible pressure of the gaze that Char gives on him um and that's the kind of stuff that the anime I think they look at this and they accentuate it like Char's not just like good at basketball he's like the best person you've ever seen at basketball in your whole life and Garma's <laughs> like okay at it and it's like you know Garma doesn't just have like a couple of flunkies Garma's like so slow in the like lap around the thing that he's like two laps behind or whatever but there's like 50 people behind him just slowly jogging um those kinds of things are exaggerated to really build out that gap and make it very distinct and more extreme and more comedic 
um, for the anime version, which I think is a, a pretty canny choice that reminds me of kind of some of the stuff that the Lord of the Rings adaptations did of like make it more dramatic because it plays better in like animation or in like a movie format if there's a much more distinct difference or contrast right. between these things. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so, you know, it makes the moments where, because also you just got to remember that all the great lines that are there in the manga are going to be read by Shuichi Ikeda, right? Uh -huh. And so you'll have the moment like when he makes, when they're, this is before Garma falls down the hill, but it's raining and Shar is under this like rock outcropping. And so he's dry and Garma is just lying under his fucking canopy. And uh, Shar looks over and says, come and join me. It's nice and dry over here. And it's like the beginning of Shar's just subtle needling of Garma. And you can tell there's just honey on his voice with every word he says. And then when he builds him the tent, he leans down and says, call it your palace. And I wrote yeah. in my notes, thus the gaslighting begins. Uh -huh. um, and so when you exaggerate all of that, it makes those moments when when Char comes in and fucking pokes him with the stick all that much funnier and, like, more dramatic. Yeah, because part of, like, the relationship between Garma and Char from, like, Garma's perspective is Char is, like, the friend who keeps him grounded because he's, like, as far as Garma knows, like, Char is just, like, the, some country boy from Texas Colony you know, who just happens to be, like, incredibly skilled and talented, but isn't, like, born into or understands, like, the world of wealth and power and politics of the Zabi family, even though, you know, as we know, Char understands that stuff very, very well. He probably understands it a lot better than Garma does because his family has been destroyed by the, the like, the game of politics that the Zabi family plays, where it's like Garma's very sheltered from it. Um, but Char lets Garma see this, like, friend that knocks all that stuff away and laughs at him when he moves in and like has the roommate thing be changed is like ha 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 but you're the only person who could do this because you're the the zombie family he's the guy who like very sarcastically calls this little tent thing he built like garma's palace with like a sarcastic jab in the ribs basically being like it's you know that we are the same and he's in this friendship for garma knocks down a lot of the pretension of his status um, and and there's something that's so fucked up about that friendship yes. that 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 is something that should be so good and enriching for Garma, but it's exactly the thing that then allows Shar to manipulate Garma whenever Shar wants to because Garma just believes what Shar tells him, and that's all there in Gundam seventy nine. Yes, that's all yep. there is is that there's this sense that like Shar is the one person in Garma's big circle who doesn't treat him as Garma Zabi you know, scion of the Zabi family. Um, he's he's the one who, like, Garma can have what he thinks are frank conversations with. Yes. And but, that's what makes it, like, the best con of all, because from Garma's perspective, Shar is in his, like, most intimate confidence. And as you say, like, he, Char, Garma understands these as, like, fully frank, honest conversations, the kinds of conversations he wouldn't be able and can't have with anybody else. Um, but that is the thing that makes the con so unbeatable is that Shar has worked his, his way into that level of relationship with Garma. Yeah, Garma thinks Shar is the most honest person in his life, and yeah. he's actually the most dishonest. That's a very good con. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a fucked up thing. So it's, a, of, it's, it's, it's so good. You feel real bad for little Garma Zabi. It's like he just <laughs> doesn't stand a fucking chance. Oh, man, but I love it all. I love him. Yeah, I love that, that they wind up being roommates, all of that stuff. It's so fucking good. Um, I course... really love the moment where um, you know Sagarma has the broken leg and everything and they like you know he has Char like lean on him and stuff and like bring him to the, the finish line or whatever from the hike and there's just these lines from the Xeon soldiers that I find very funny it's just like, it's like we see them they're there it's Char's novel and it's Garma's hobby it's like oh he's on Char's shoulder they're smiling they're waving they're laughing uh, it's, <laughs> yes, and it's, it's just like good. the way the guy's saying it is like a reporter uh it's just there's something about those lines i find very funny and i like whoever you know plays like the like random zeon soldier that delivers those lines like gets the like humor of those lines and how like sort of formalized they are um and this is like <laughs> oh they're waving and smiling it's all okay uh it's great well, and Char is playing it up. He's got this like yes. big doofy grin on his face, <laughs> and he's waving, and it's just so good. He's he knows exactly what role to play. 
Um, as much as I'm going to praise Shuichi Keda in this episode, I also do want to give a shout out to Garma's VA. Um, originally voiced by Katsuji Mori in the original anime, now voiced here by Tetsuya Kakihara. I think he's fucking great. It's a great Garmazabi yeah. performance. Yeah, it's 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 a really great performance. That it like you know, it's not a thing that it's not him trying to do an impression of the original performance, but he's got a similar kind of voice. Only, but like, it, but especially like, it feels like a younger version of that character that's a bit more immature. Um, yeah, and this uh, actor uh, Tetsuya Kakihara is in a lot of stuff. The main thing that people would know him from probably is he's the main character of Gurren Lagann. Um, he's also one of the main characters of the fairy tale anime. I mean, that he's just like in a lot of stuff. Like he's just a pretty ubiquitous um, actor. Um, and yeah, it's a really, really solid performance that's dialed in just right of where it feels comedic at times because the character is very comedic, but there's always that very grounded heart of this sort of very spoiled but kind of earnest and compassionate young man that is who Garma is. Like, Garma's not a bad person. He's, like, a pretty good person. He's, like, in the ranking of the zombies, he's probably just below Dozel, who I would say, like, Dozel is probably the best of them. Because um, Dozel at least has... Dozel has real substance. Garma doesn't yeah. have a whole lot of substance to him. Um, but, yeah, Garma is, is the one, yeah, by far the most well-adjusted, I would say. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and if he didn't have this very like parasitic relationship with Char that like stunts his development. Garma could have potentially been like a pretty cool dude. Um, but he definitely like his relationship with Char, I think you see like cages him in many ways. Um, and, and, and that dynamic is definitely here in this episode. Yeah. Shoo! So, you know, moving into sort of the second half of the episode, I want to talk about Sean, what I think is one of the, it's not a change because it's, it's filling in history we didn't know before, but I think one of the boldest additions Yasuhiko makes to the Gundam lore, which is having Shara's novel be fairly central in instigating the One Year War. Mm -hmm. That's a bold thing that he does um it's actually even bolder in the manga there's one yes. significant change we should talk about here and this is what i was mentioning earlier in the ova version the the episode that we're talking about this week there is this event where a a federation ship wants to cut in line at the docking bay basically and it inadvertently causes a big crash that takes out an agricultural block and that leads to the big zeon riots that then help instigate the the dawn rebellion that char engineers and all of that right yeah. In the manga, um, and I think this is, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the biggest change in this episode at least, is the way that whole thing goes is that there's a meteor on a path to pass by side three space. Char in his dorm has hacked into the Fed monitoring station responsible for observing asteroids, and Garma sees him doing it, and Char points out there's a meteor on a highly risky orbit, but Garma thinks, hey, it's the monitoring station, they haven't raised alarm, it must be okay, and Char seems pretty shifty. Then the next day, there's this scene that is not in the in the anime, where Dozel is um, giving the graduation speech, because they're moving out from being cadets to, to graduating from the, from the academy. And Char is checking his watch through this whole scene, which we see Garma keeps looking at him, and, and Char is checking his watch. And then we cut to the monitoring station where everyone is freaking out. There's been a basic input error, is what they say, that caused them not to see the true trajectory of the meteor until it's too late. Now it's on a collision course with side three. It has a high chance of sitting Zoom City. Um, it makes contact during Dozel's speech, and that is the thing that knocks out the agricultural block. And then there's a little more detail about that, how that sort of creates a fallout through Xeon. Um, and that is the, the thing that instigates this widespread dissatisfaction amidst, amidst uh, the Xeon citizenry. And so the implication, without ever telling us, is that Char clearly had something to do with this event as well. And that is completely removed in the anime, although the anime still has him be fully responsible for the Dawn Rebellion, which is also one of the instigating events of the One Year War. Yeah, because there's there's a lot of like knock on changes that come along with this stuff, and this this is like the biggest difference because yeah, because there's there's kind of two dynamics with the way that that sequence works in the manga because it's you can read it as like Char did something specifically, which like I think there's lots of evidence for that, or it is also just like the because the way the political situation works out from the Zeon perspective is that the the federation being the thing that manages these kinds of like meteor countermeasures and things like that and 
all that and not allowing that to be the domain of the colonies being the political controversy. I like that more than the like traffic thing. I do too. I like it a lot OVA more. Yeah. Does. Because there's this whole, there's a very different dynamic of the tension here between the Federation and Zeon in the manga versus the the OVA. And the OVA, it, it escalates very dramatically and very quickly to like Federation squads end up sh opening fire on Zeon protesters um, and stuff like that. And that doesn't happen in the manga. In the manga, it is, there is this slow building tension about like who has what political rights based on you know the zeons who are like a colonized people and the federation who are colonizers and it's the classic you know like america kind of any you know um dispute that has caused a colon colony to go independent oftentimes a lot of the one of the major factors is that political issues are being determined by people who are don't actually live in or are not affected by the place that those political issues are determining the like quality of life of um, and so that political issue, I think, is like a little bit more grounded and interesting with the I think the Char thing is silly. Like, I don't like the implication. So I just in my head, I'm like, eh, Char didn't do it because I think that's it's unnecessary and it's too much. But that basic political scenario, I think, is a little bit more kind of potent and grounded. And then the fallout of it is this growing tension where the there are more protests amongst the Xeon. Um, and then the Federation are moving troops and repositioning troops to be more in the proximity of Zoom City and, and Side 3. And so there's this sense of like the pressure of this situation is building and building and building. And that's the opportunity that Shar then sees to begin this thing of attacking um, the nearby Federation base in order to disarm it. Um, instead of the way the OVA portrays it, which is more like there is already some kind of low-scale conflict that is occurring. And because of that low-scale conflict, Shar is like, it's our duty, Garma, to like go and take this base rather than it being a very kind of preemptive thing that they do in, in the manga. And I'll say that like, generally speaking, I, I prefer the like manga's depiction of the way those political tensions like build and evolve. Whereas like the OVA, I understand why they do this. They kind of simplify it and make it more direct and like dramatic in order to make it easier to move those pieces along. Whereas it's very like much more deliberate and implied the way that the manga does it. I, yeah, I agree with all of that. I think the main reason the anime makes that change is just because the thing with the meteor and all of that is a pretty long series of events mm -hmm. that is harder to depict in an anime, I think, than it would be on the page. Um, and so they go for something a little more direct and visual. Um, I generally agree with you. I think the idea that Char is playing... 25 dimensional chess and it's like well if i let this asteroid because obviously the implication is not that shark did anything to the asteroid that'd be impossible it's that yeah. he messed with their systems enough that they didn't catch it in time um and i think that's that strains credulity i think i, I think shara's novel is many things i think the idea that he would be planning far enough ahead that like if i if i do this and the meteor hits then they'll respond this way and then, but, 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 and then i can do this that's like I, I don't buy that and I think that's dumb you can now you can very easily yeah. read the scene as just that he is monitoring it and he's curious and engaged in the overall political situation because he's looking for an opening and I buy that 100% and I think the scene can be read that way and it's fine um, it yeah. is intentionally vague but overall I agree with you I think the 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 whole thing with the meteor because it's also just one of those pieces of world building that Gundam in general is just so good at of like, well, if you had people in space and you had all these colonies, you would naturally need a good like bureau for monitoring like stellar objects, right? You would yeah. need someone thinking about that. We have that on Earth right now to a certain extent. Um, and then what if it was this exact scenario where the Earth Bureau tasked with that missed something, it hit the colonies and then the colonies are like, well, clearly you guys are not invested enough in this because it doesn't affect you. This should be in our hands. It's very much like the Boston Tea Party kind of thing. Like, yeah. was 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 the tea tax in and of itself enough to cause a revolution? Obviously not. But it stood in for this larger issue of like, fuck you guys. This stands in for all the things that make us angry about not being self-governed. And that's the kind of like, that's where Yasuhiko just fucking shines is in this level yeah. of historical thinking that like, blends with Tomino's storytelling in a perfect way for this like very fulsome world building. Yeah, it is to say that like the OVA does do some of that stuff very well in some scenes that we kind of skipped over of there's, you know, multiple scenes that really show you the tension between the Federation, which is technically in control, um, but like 
the very blatant efforts by Zeon of like creating a standing trained military yes. directly under the watch and view and purview of the Federation and all of that stuff, which is, you know, pulled directly from the manga and is adapted very faithfully. In that kind of first half of the episode, I think is very vibrant and feels very like historically literate. There are lots and lots and lots of instances, both like with America, again, like Nazi Germany is a very clear um, comparison point of this of like, because of a lot of complicated political factors, you know, even if you strongly assume that this group of people is like just building a rebellion right in front of you and using some of your resources to do it, like if you try to intervene in any direct way, you then just become the like you become the flame that then lights the whole thing off. Um, and so it's like it's almost become too late by the time that this academy is being developed for the Federation to actually interfere. And you see the way that slowly all the political power, capital, and influence that the Federation has in this kind of sphere is being taken away from them. Um, and like the most dramatic scene of that is the the at the end of their like mock battle or whatever that Shar and Garma and all of them participate in, and the Federation officer reading out his little instructions. Shar asks a bunch of very like pointed, snobbish questions about the whole thing, and then begins this whole series of events where he gets slapped. Um, that those tensions of the officer thinking he's in charge and actually it's all these kids that are the ones who are in charge because it's their home they're the ones with the political influence that dynamic to me is like really vibrant and effective yes i think that's the thing the anime pulls out and does a great job with because it, it all comes to a head in that scene but we have several moments beforehand like mm -hmm. uh early in the episode you have the welcome ceremony where Shar comes in late and sits down and is next to Lino the kid he's gonna kill at the end of the episode um and all of that and you have General Revel is there in yeah. the room and and you have Dozel who is the superintendent of the school I fucking love that detail by the way I oh. totally believe Girin would give Dozel Zabi this job that he is absolutely not in like Dozel Zabi is many things. I don't think he's superintendent of the uh -huh. Zeon Military Academy material, but Dozel is doing that job. And Dozel starts by saying like, "Thank you, General Revel, for being in attendance." Fuck you, Federation, and goes off yeah. on this like just like absolute like kind of like tear. And you just see Revel sitting there, and like I suspect Revel is someone were he fully in charge would do something about this. But clearly, there's some like. We never get details on this. There is some Neville Chamberlain-esque politician in the uh -huh. Federation who is like on this like road of appeasement with Zeon, and it's not working. Obviously, the same way that like, yeah, we'll we'll let Hitler have this piece of land. He can have he can have Poland. That's okay, you know, like that kind of thing, like over and over again until finally like you have to fight the war. Um, yeah, and then you do come up to the moment where Shar has these questions, and I love Shar's pointed questions to the guy is it's it's two things he brings up he has one is like why are we doing these military exercises where we would fight at such a disadvantage what force would we be fighting where we are at this level of a uh -huh. disadvantage and second does the zeon military exist just to underline to us how much bigger your military is and uh, that's what gets him slapped i love that scene i think it's phenomenally animated where the slap happens the glasses go up it's one of the best renderings of a Yasuhiko character panel from the manga of Shar turning back and the guy sees the eyes, the eyes of terror for a moment. And then all the students come in chanting, pick it up. Garma, this is like the most fulsome moment Garma has in his role as leader ever because I think he has genuine friendly affection for Shar. Um, and without Shar having to say one more word, that whole class is riled up and the dude gets on his knees and picks up the glasses for him. It is a very chilling scene. Yeah, that that is so effective at demonstrating like the political power dynamics and how they have shifted at this point. Um and 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 Shar's canniness of that like this is the exact scenario that he wanted. It's why he spoke out of turn. He knew that this would happen and that's like the look on in his eyes, right? That yeah. like the the Federation commander slaps the glasses off. He sees Char's expression in his eyes and is like, Char has won, right? It's like the officer didn't even realize he was playing Char's game, but he was playing Char's game and Char has just won. Um, and it is such a, that that is like where you see Char's political savvy at play. That's where you see his ability to manipulate things as he can read where the power dynamics have been moving in this space and is able to see like an exact string to pull on to his advantage um 
Because there's also, in this is a scene they cut out of the anime, but there's an implication later on in the manga that one of the reasons why he does that is because he knows it's like it, it's going to be a mark against him for insubordination, which then ranks him number two in the academy, and Garma gets to be number one, so that Garma gets to be put up into the supreme place that Garma realizes this is why Char did this thing. Um, not a scene that like is necessary, but it's like a nice additional detail um, yes. if you read the manga version. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that if they... That's like the kind of detail from Lord of the Rings that would only be in the extended cut. But I yes. like that kind of detail yeah. a lot. I, I remember that. Um, because <laughs> I... Although I have to admit, I'm not sure how Garma got to number two given everything we saw earlier. But it's fine. Um, he's very <laughs> smart, you know. He like He's the only the other dude who's able to do most of that like extremely weird, complicated, insane equation. And he only fucks up at one part. That's true. That is very true. So... But obviously the main string Char pulls on in this episode is the detail that this is a Xeon military academy right next to a giant fed base where they are pouring soldiers in to put down this growing rebellion in the colony. And Char sees this moment to use Garma's clout to stage what will later be known as the Dawn Rebellion. And before we get into that, just whole side of the episode sean i kind of want to come back to a question i was starting to pose earlier which is certainly with the dawn rebellion however you want to read the meteor strike in the manga char has a vested interest in getting a war going in this version mm -hmm. of the story and i do think that's one of the most interesting and bold details in the origin what do you think of that as a part of this whole prequel project that char has a fairly direct hand in starting the one-year war I think it makes sense. I think I think one thing that works for it is that it's not a thing of like it's never portrayed as the one year war wouldn't have happened. Exactly. It's just that like it happens earlier. Um because he you helps do push have, it along. Yeah, yeah. Because you do have a scene in the manga with Girin and Degen that like they is technically in the anime, but it's like the dialogue is completely different where you see how much like Girin is like chomping at the heels of like wanting this war to start and like his propaganda efforts and all of that that he is really spurring on um all these protests behind the scenes and that degwin is not happy with this because degwin as we talked about in episode one he is a very cautious careful politician he doesn't want a war because a war is chaos like any i mean this is something you can see in like the current american political scenario Republic, the last thing a Republican would want in America right now would be like a civil war or a big armed conflict um, because there is a risk whenever you have like huge revolutionary violence outbreaks, you don't know which side that coin is going to fall on, whether or not your side is going to win or the other side will win. So if you're comfortably in power and you can just nudge that in your direction bit by bit by bit, that's a lot safer than like rolling the dice of a revolution and like opening up the potential of like extreme violence because you have no idea how those revolutions are going to go. But Girin is so hungry for power and he, because he's not number one, he wants this war to happen really bad. And he's kind of doing everything he can to nudge all those efforts along. Char just happens to be in a particular spot where he can take advantage of the existing political unrest to do a thing that would likely have happened without his input. But because he does it first, it gives him like clout that then eventually is going to think that allows him to be a mobile suit pilot that allows him to be under Dolzal Zabi's command that allows him to be at the position of influence that he really wants to be in. It is also, I and mean, all of that is true, but it is also, this is kind of where the anime starts playing on a theme. It's there in the manga, but I think it's one of the things the anime kind of brings out in adaptation. And it, it's, it's the note that episode six, the final episode, I think very pointedly ends on the cut to credits, not the post credit stuff, mm -hmm. which is this idea that this war happens because enough people in the world want it. And yes. like, there is this, there is some fucking sickness, pathology, whatever you want to call it in the human condition in this time and place that there is enough yearning for let's just fight this fucking thing out. And there's a lot of people with a vested interest in that, from Giran Zabi, who sees it as naked power, to General Revel, who sees it as, I'm going to put these fuckers down, I'm finally off the leash, basically. Like, mm -hmm. let's do this. That's kind of uh, the Antarctic Treaty comes down to a lot of that, or the Antarctic speech he gives, um, which you'll see in episode six. Um, to Shah Aznabil, who, he wants a war to fight in. Like, I think that's like a simple yeah. little thing, is that like, in part, because it will help him get closer to the Zabis and all of this stuff. But also... I think Char thinks it's going to be fucking fun, right? 
Like that is one yeah. of the underlying things in this episode is that Shar is living his best life. He is having the time of his fucking life in this episode, as we know he generally does through all the one year war stuff. Shar Osnabel has a good time doing all of this stuff. And I think that is one of the like provocative and interesting things this anime does. And it's it's not as simplistic as saying like, oh yeah, wars happen because people like war. I don't think it's that simple. What it is is there's enough people with enough there's enough people who have their hands on the levers of power who want to do this thing that it happens. And I do think that's a general truth about war is it happens when there's enough people with their hands on the levers of power to make it happen. You know, the Iraq war in America didn't come out of the blue. There were a lot of people, a lot of conservatives and neoliberals and all this stuff who wanted to go to war with Iraq. And eventually there were enough of them with their hands on the levers that when 9-11 happened, they were able to move those levers. You know? Yeah, that 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 th those inciting incidents are excuses. They're not like they're not like direct causes. Um, they are excuses that people then use to go to war. And the Iraq War is like a very good example of that because Iraq had jackal shit to do with nine eleven. Yes, but it creates this excuse to go do the war that you want to do for like you know. And then lots of people that are involved in that have their own motivations, either because they're like ideological racists or you know whatever um or they want like they're more practical and they just want the resources and they want the power um that those resources come with um but that that's definitely a dynamic you see here and that char is one of those people and you get a line that I, I i think the manga builds up to this line better because there's something i i definitely prefer about the like that this is a like you know powder keg where the pressure is building but it hasn't gone off yet and i think the dynamic of the federation having like actually killed people in those riots like waters it down a little bit yeah but there is a key line for char here um that is when he's convincing garma to actually do this thing i know what you're gonna say line he has um where he says don't then i have the japanese verses this is a transition off the top of my head but basically like don't you want to turn the gears of history with your own two hands um and the way that that's built up to and the way he says it it's very much like he's saying that to Garma, but he's also like declaring, this is the thing I want to do. Like, this is why I'm doing this, because I want to take the gears and cogs of history and turn them with my own two hands and express my power on the flow of history itself. And like, that's the thing that he does. That's why he wants to do it. Um, and, and it's like, at the end of the day, that feels like that's his primary motivation in this whole crazy rebellion he starts up. Absolutely. Also, Sean, um, the translation you gave off the top of your head is word for word verbatim the translation in the subtitles because it's in Very my good. notes. <laughs> no, it is a great, it's a phenomenal line. It's one of those, you know, some of Shuichi Keita's Sharisms make you laugh heartily and some of them send a goddamn chill down your spine. This one sends a chill down your spine, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's definitely, it's a really good piece of writing by Yushikazu Yasuhiko because the way it's phrased in Japanese is so, like you can't, even if it you gave that line to another character, you wouldn't be able to read it in anything other than Shuichi Keita's Char voice because it's such a Char ass <laughs> fucking Char line. Um, it is to me like one of like the iconic Char lines. Like you know, is like you know, um, it's it's uh, there's nothing more dreadful than like looking back on the the mistakes of one's youth and stuff like that. Like he just right. has these lines he gives that you're like, this is this is a line for this character that you will always remember. Yes, absolutely. Um... I love when when Shar brings the plan to Garma. I love how like terrifyingly well developed the plan is. Like Shar uh -huh. has planned this thing to a T. He's basically giving Garma this like genius military operation on a silver platter. And of course, you know, here's the thing: Garma is not it, at any level. I think the kind of person who actually wants to turn the gears of history with his own two hands, right? Yes. Um, he's doing it because, you know, Senpai noticed him, basically, right? It's it's uh -huh. to do it because Char... Char's always led me right before, right? So let's do a rebellion. Um, you also get here, and I think we should talk about the entire subplot with Lino, the boy who knew Char Osnabel, the Western kid from Texas, um, and figures out that yeah. this kid is not Char Osnabel. Yeah, so this is the other like major change, and is in addition. Um, uh, there is an entire subplot here, which is very much I think is like here to give this episode where how it ends and to give it its like fulsome like circular arc. But yes, you have Lino, 
who is a character that exists in the manga, but he just doesn't have this role. All he is is like Shara's old roommate that Garma replaces, and then he does get killed in the rebellion. Um, and he's one of like a number of students who like Garma is like holding his picture or whatever in a big parade. Um, but here, Lino figures out um, Shara's actual identity. There's a really good beat that they add into that mock battle of Lino asking him, it's like, oh man, this is just like when you ran that like touchdown in Luna football or whatever the fuck crazy. It's called Luna space ball. Game. Yeah. yeah. Luna ball. Um, and Shara's like, what? Yeah. Okay. Huh. And you know, obviously from our perspective, we know that it's like a rhetorical trap because that Luna ball game never happened. Um, and yeah. And then they move the scene of where Shar tries on the headset to being one where it's just he and Lino um, alone whereas in the manga he puts it on in front of Garma which I, I wish that Garma was there because it's such a I like the idea of Garma seeing the moment of Char being anointed with his like crazy weird mask thing yes um, but but this dynamic is the thing that gives the entire last act of this episode its focus um, because it's not now just about Char executing this plan and you see it in much more detail in the anime because you want this like big action scene because we haven't really had a big action scene in the series since the end of episode one um you want the big crazy action scene but also now Shar has this other objective of this like weird kid um that is a loose end and if there's one thing that Shar as novel is not going to fucking stand for it's a loose fucking end and he's going to cut that thing off um, and, and this is I think a very good smart adaptational change to give this episode it's like focus to a like clear ending point by creating a new dynamic and a new subplot with this character. I was very surprised when I read the manga because I was actually uh -huh. very excited to get to those pages and see like how they did the thing with Lino in the manga. Um, because this is one of my favorite things in the anime. I love yes. this entire plot. And I do think it's overall an improvement to add this in because I think it, it just adds so much. I like the idea that Char gets his iconic headpiece from someone he fucking unambiguously betrays and murders is so perfect. It's one of those that's yeah. like, of course he got his name from someone he murdered. He also gets his mask from someone he murders. The other thing I love about the Lino thing, like my only hesitation in saying that what he does to the real Shara's novel isn't his cruelest thing is because what he does to Lino might be even uh -huh. crueler. Because here's the thing, Lino gives him every reason on earth to keep him around. Lino is a true believer in the Xeon cause. He doesn't like the Zabis. He recognizes that he's Casfall Rem Daikun and he wants him to be. Like he wants this, like he wants Casfall to come to power. He's loyal, right? Like this is, yeah. it's a loose end, but it's a very loyal loose end. He fucking worships the ground Char walks on. You know, when Char says, hey, go get this tank over here. He's like, Senpai noticed me. Thank you. This is so great. You know, he's so happy about it over and over again. And I think Char would kill him no matter what. But the thing is, I think it's when he is yelling out, Casval, 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 and you realize that's the name he's been calling him by. More than anything else, that's the thing that gets you killed in Char Aznobel's presence. Because he, he's not Casval, and he doesn't want to yeah. hear that name. And there's that line there when after he, he gets Lino blown up, and then he flies out of the explosion on his fucking jetpack, and the Red Comet theme for this series, the musical piece, is, like, soaring. It's, it's at its big, like, full expression. And he says, Boku wa kasval janai, Sharaz Nabal da. Like, he is, I am, da. Yeah. He's like, I am Sharaz Nabal. Um, they even do a great piece of mirroring here, where I mentioned earlier that when the ship with the real Sharaz Nabal blows up, Kaecilia's face comes out of that. Uh, like as a as a fade, yeah. they do the same thing here. Where when the tank blows up with Lino in it, Shar's face fades out of that. So it's the same kind of like murder, um, and and that is like and and then right after that is when he enters the control room. They have him framed by this big red emergency light outside. He is the red comet in all but name at this point, and it is such a delicious birth of that persona. Yeah, because that's where, that's like, because that's the arc they've built, right, for this episode. I mean, it's like why the subplot's really important is to, like, create that moment where he, like, directly and dramatically accepts this, like, full identity of, like, the Shara's novel that we know. Because at the beginning of the episode is when he, like, technically adopts the identity and you see the death of the old Shara's novel and this one taking it over. Um, but this is where it's not just he is now, like, posing as this other person. He has become a new person who is Shara's novel, right? And yes. that's what he is claiming here. And, yeah, 
I think the the thing that like why he kills Lino is very much the like Lino sees him as Castle Rim Daikun and that is an identity that we know Char abandons, right? Like he does Char does not have any interest in actually being Castle Rim Daikun and he throws that off, he runs away from it. Like him killing the zombies has nothing to do with him wanting to be in power. It's not because he wants to take the throne as Castle Rim Daikun. He just wants to express his anger and like it gives him an excuse and a target. And then in, Z in Zeta Gundam, he spends the whole thing as Quattro Bajina, and he doesn't want to be Castle Rim Daikun or Char. He doesn't want to be this relic of the old war. He just wants to be who he is. Um, and, and he's running away from that responsibility. And then in Shard's counterattack, where he is, for an extended time, has to adopt the role of Castle Rim Daikun, as we talked about in Shard's counterattack episode, in many ways, that's the time when Char feels the most false and has put on the thickest mask, is him parading himself as the, the castle rim daikun that people want him to be and so this like person who sees him as that old identity that he has abandoned it's not even because it's like a security risk or like because Cassilia might find out it's because it's like no i can't have someone around that thinks of me as castle rim daikun because that's not who i am i'm shara's novel um and that is such a like powerful definitive note to create this like story on for this anime version also, the fucking way he does it is such a yeah. perfect char betrayal of trust, you know, giving him, like, making this kid think he's going to go be a hero. Like, go take that tank. Here's our special channel. Only us can communicate on channel 10, kid. And then, like, go get the tank. He gets the tank. He's like, Char, I did it. I got the tank. And he's not calling him Char. He's calling him Casfall. And then Char doesn't say a word. He lets the other people on his, like, squad believe that Lino died going to get that tank. And they're all like, oh, damn it, fuck that tank. And they all get their rocket launchers out. And Lino is just yelling, Caswell, please stop it. Like, these are my allies. And they blow him the fuck up. Char doesn't have to pull one single trigger to kill this kid. And he flies around smiling and declaring himself Char Osnabel. It's, of course, that's how Char Osnabel is born. Yeah, it, it's really fucking cold. Because it is particularly, <laughs> it's like the fact that he doesn't, he, he like does the least amount of effort possible to get that scenario in place. Yes. Like the main <laughs> thing he does is just tell that, you know, go get that tank and stay on this communication channel. Cause this is like what the channel we're going to use. And that's it. And then the rest of the scenario just kind of plays out. Um, and, and, and that's like the thing that's terrifying about it. It's very much like how he orchestrates Garma's death. It's just like, it's just a couple of small nudges. And then he just sits back and watches um, as, as what he wanted to be comes into the world which is lena's horrible awful dramatic <laughs> death by like the people that he they are his friends who thought that they were avenging lena's death when what they were actually doing was killing him it's fucked up. man i wonder what char's body count is at this point already just three episodes into the origin because he has killed people in all three episodes yep. dozens of people at the end of episode one the guy in the night suit of armor in episode two and then here indirectly kills two people gets a bunch of people killed in the dawn rebellion you know just he is already amassing a fucking throne of bodies yes and and he gives a grand total of zero fucks about it <laughs> that is very true so you know the ending narration tells us that this would later be known as the dawn rebellion which is great it's a red morning smoke fire the sunrise it's actually one of the pieces of the anime that i think that's the best at em like emulating mm -hmm. the look of the color spreads in Yasuhiko's manga. And this episode ends with one of my favorite, favorite, yep. favorite lines Shuichi Keita has ever gotten to say as Shar. Akaina, jitsu ni i iro da. Which is, everything is red. It's a good color, isn't it? Fucking yeah. god damn it, Sean. I have had, uh, like, a screenshot of that saved on my desktop for years. Because it is like, I every time I watch this episode, I have to rewind and listen to Ikeda say it like five times. It's so fucking good. Yeah, and it's a scene that doesn't exist in the manga. It's 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 like their created endpoint for the story, and it is yes, it is so fucking good. It is a just, <laughs> it's another just great all time great Char line. Um, that that's that's because that's where Shichi Keita just just drips off of every single line or yes. word in that line. Um, it is amazing. Yeah, and it's it's just the perfect way to end. And again, creates this very good clear dramatic arc of he started this he started this episode out as castle slash edward mass and now he ends it as 
like this new creature this like you know the red comet basically um but this man bathed in red it's called shara's novel um and 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 that's where we leave off for this episode and it, it is yeah and one of the, like the best endings of a thing in gundam yes um, which is I mean, a I just, that I, has lots of great fucking endings in it i've got you know i typed the line up in my notes in in kanji and kana and just looking at it mm-hmm. i hear ikeda's voice dripping off of it you know like yes, just that. it's like the gears of history line it's yeah. just like you, you you can't imagine anybody else saying that line of dialogue because it's like just so purely a shara's novel piece of dialogue god it's so fucking good we should probably rewind a little bit though and talk about there are pieces with other characters in this episode a couple of which are probably worth mentioning we do have a scene with Sela on side five yes um where we learn that Shar has not kept in touch with the Osnabel family at all reminding us that every person he kills he hurts a lot of other people too because he's yeah, an there's asshole a very sad piece of dialogue where like uh Mr. Osnabel uh basically says like well you know at this point since my son went off to the military academy he's effectively dead to me it's like oh my god like you don't even know <laughs> you don't know how dead to you he actually is oh my and god it's really fucked up yeah a uh, little preview, Char is not done fucking with that family. We'll get into that yep. later. Um, and I think the notable thing here is Sela has three graves now. She has Lucifer, her mother, and Casfall. She's becoming a doctor because, as she says at the graves, she's seen too many people die, too much sadness. I think it's a great line. And I also think like that little scene right in the middle of this episode underlines just how fucking selfish Char is uh-huh. in all of this. Because he is out there having the absolute time of his fucking life at the military academy, living it up as Shara's novel, playing with Garma. This is like, he is living his best life. And he has left Sela alone, abandoned. All of her family is dead to her. She has some maybe sense that Shar isn't dead, but like, you know, she can't do anything about that. And she's yeah. just alone. And she's made other friends. Like, she has people like Tia- Tiabolo who are very good to her, but like, what a what like it's a miracle Sela did not turn into a dick after all of this like it speaks to what a good person she is um that all of that just made her want to be better not want to be worse yes yeah and it is a a really important piece of contrast in the middle of the episode to remind you of like Sela is out there and and that she is like the actual strong good person of the two siblings um and Char is yeah this selfish fucking monster um for everything that he's done we get a phenomenal scene with Girin coming to the MS program. Yeah. And he wants to cancel the whole thing because he, he like takes one look at the mobile work and he's like, that looks like shit. And then he gets to hear from Dr. Minofsky himself. This is, I think, a very fun part of the origin. You get to meet the man behind the Minofsky particle. And he basically explains the whole theory of why you need mobile suit combat. Um, and Girin is on board after that and says the next unit will be called the MSO-3. And all the fan, you know, you just go, ooh, it's the MSO3, yep. it's the Zaku. Uh, but yes, uh, Ginga Banjo, fantastic in that scene. Yeah, it's just it's just a great scene. And it, it's just one where it, it's a thing where all of the world building elements in that scene are part of like all Universal Century Gundam of like the reasoning yes. for mobile suits, why they exist, like how they work with the reactor, on the Minovsky particles and how they function, its relationship to the ships. But like, you never have it like actually sort of like explained or exposited in a like direct clear scene like i remember in the first or second weekly suit gundam episode i have to like explain some of that stuff because it's very right. like opaque um and like very broad in mobile suit gundam even though like all the details are there it's just not explained to you in, in particular detail it's more for you to kind of pick up um and there is something just very satisfying just because universal century gundam is one of the most incredible pieces of like science fiction world building in anything and it's and it's we've been away from uc gundam for long enough um and particularly in like the weeds of a uc gundam project for long enough that it's like getting to admire again the elegance of that sci-fi world building setup and the elegance of the justification for having mechs which are there in actuality because you can sell good toys about mechs and that's like why you would make this show with mechs in it but the the genius of of tomino and the rest of that team of building out that whole like complex reasoning and making it feel so real and so grounded it's just one of the most impressive pieces of world building i've ever seen and so like having professor manofsky like really kind of put a pin on it here and and in a way that feels 
very appropriate because of how it's situated as a prequel that the character that is saying it and who he is saying it to that this is the only reason why the Zeons are as successful in the war as they are otherwise they'd get completely destroyed as Degwin Zabi fears um, is that like they have this one technological innovation because this is the turning point this is like the invention of the fucking firearm this is like the invention of airplanes this is the invention of a thing or like tanks this is the invention of drones. This is the invention of a new thing that changes what combat looks like forever. Um, and it's such a great expression of that. Um, it's it's just a very fun fun scene that reminds me of like how much I really love this, this world. Oh, 100%. And like, you know, so much of the project of the origin manga, I think, does also come down to like taking a lot of that world building, particularly like, you know, the original novelization has all of this exposited very <laughs> clearly in like very long passages where... Tomino lets his nerd flag fly and like tells you all of it and then the manga finds ways to really narrativize it in cool ways and I think that's one of those scenes um but yeah I love it um what else we got here uh I think we should also mention that we get the first scene with Zena and Dozel Zena is one of the yes. girls at the academy um if you if you know your Gundam history you recognize the name Zena and you know that this woman will one day marry Dozel Zabi but right now it seems a little improbable because she is the one who is sent to go hold up Dozel. I do think that's the one hole in Shar's plan. I don't know why he thought a girl holding a single handgun on Dozel Zabi would stop Dozel Zabi, but there you go. Because he knows that Dozel Zabi is like a sweetheart, right? That like that's, that's the reason yeah. why he sends her specifically is because he knows that like if it if it was like a big strong tough dude that he sent, Dozel would have like crushed that guy like a fucking tin can yes. between his hands. Um, but because it's like this very attractive young woman, Dozel's sense of like sort of like, you know, chauvinistic honor and stuff like that is not going to allow him to do anything. Um, and he and, hears that it's Garma doing it, so he's yes. not going to go stop Garma because he doesn't want to hurt Garma. Yeah, it's like like she's there to like disarm him enough to like allow that Garma fact to, to sink in. I think it's like Shar has yeah. a good read on like who Dozel is as a person. Um the, the the thing I love about that scene though is like your entry into it, which is Dozel in his like office wearing a bathrobe, and like someone <laughs> at an intercom tells him that there's a student that like has some like problems and wants his counseling, and he's like, hmm, and like, and, like just seeing Dozel like being very thoughtful and thing is like, I oh, like what could I possibly do to help her? And she comes in and it's like, oh, so what kind of problems are you having? Your grades? Is it a boy? Is the do you feel like the military life is not for you? Of it's like him trying to be this like good guy who actually wants to help out these students because you know no student has ever come to him on like office hours or whatever <laughs> shit he's got yes. to go talk to Do Dozel Zabi the 8 foot tall giant covered in scars that looks like the Frankenstein fucking monster um, about oh their God. problems this is like the only time he's had like a wholesome interaction with one of his students and that is like incredibly funny it's it's so good. They they use Dozel for humor so so well in this series because it's he's comic relief, but it's not selling the character short. It's always playing off of things we know about him that are true, um, and it's so good. Yeah, I fucking love that. Um, in the scene with Degwin and Girin, you have a little intimation um, about you get a lot of this in the origin about how much Degwin really loves Garma, and Degwin straight up says to Girin here, "If anything happens to Garma, I will never forgive you." We know how that will go in the full anime so lots of good stuff to come there yeah because uh, that scene that's the one that like is because all of that is basically new dialogue because that's a much longer scene that goes more into like the politics of the, the yes. revolts and stuff like that they talked about earlier but they're kind of taking because there will be they do adapt the scene in the next episode but like there you get more of the like sense of how much Degwin cares about Garma later but because it's a later scene they kind of lift some of that content and put it here to contextualize what's happening in, in the sequence of events that they've ordered it in this adaptation. Yes. And then finally, we do get a post credit scene in this episode mm -hmm. where you have Amuro arriving on side seven. They go by Luna 2. He goes through security with Haro. I fucking adore um, Toru Furia's reading of when he goes through, he says, Amuro Ray, 13 years old. And like, yes. it's it's a great, cute little line reading. And then Tem Ray being the dick of all dick fathers tells Amro, you'll be alone now you're gonna have to be the man of the house you should go make some friends because it's not gonna be me kid fucking terrible dad and then they step out onto side seven and, and see the whole i think the way yasuhiko draws side seven is so phenomenal because he has this specific interest in the idea of this being an unfinished colony mm -hmm. with this big wall that they can't go past and that's this like 
and that's there in the beginning of the manga it's there in this prequel stretch and you see it here and it's really well rendered um but this is a very fun little post credit scene yeah yeah it's just like a fun little little bonus and you just get to be reminded god tim ray fucking sucks <laughs> fucking sucks. such a dick because yeah because they do they cut out um here i don't if from what i remember i don't think they put it in anywhere else in the later episodes in the manga you get a whole scene of him um being brought onto the mobile suit project like before any of this happens mm -hmm. um which i don't remember if that is something that they like put into one of the later episodes of the origin um but yeah it's just like a way to establish like yeah on the federation side they have footage knowing that like there's some sort of secret mobile worker project that the Xeons are working on and tim ray we're gonna have you start kind of brainstorming what that looks like for the federation yes but all in all sean what a fantastic fucking episode this is <laughs> Yeah, it's it's phenomenal, and it's and it's interesting having like you know read the manga, um, you know right next to watching the episode because this is the one that they make like very big changes and additions and things like that. But I think they're generally it's the kind of thing where it's like I don't know if I would say one is my favorite version over the other. I like that they like kind of work in concert really well. Like if you want the more like sort of grounded like more thoughtful political exploration stuff the manga is a lot better at that but if you want the like very dramatic vivid character arc for shara's novel becoming shara's novel like that zooming in on that with this episode that's just something that like the origin manga doesn't do in that kind of like very precise way um and i think that that's just a really cool choice that makes it very rich to engage with both versions the original and and this adaptation thank god we have both you know yes it's awesome and thank god we have three more of these to do sean because i'm having a ton of fun we have next week we'll have part four eve of destiny and uh i man there's a lot of good stuff in the back half that we're going to get to yes and, and then now i I'm, i can continue reading the origin and we'll see how how much can i read will i be done with it by the time we record the next episode i don't know the manga is very good there is a lot of it but i have not been able to stop so far um, so we will find out next week on Weekly Suit Gundam. <laughs>